Hey, thanks hey. for joining us. I'm Shahab Zagari, and I'm here with... Ashley Stone. And what you uh, might know is that this is a brand new podcast. What you might not know is that Ashley and I go way back. We go way back. These are true facts. Uh, we've known each other for not quite a decade, but I am I feel like it's almost there somewhere. It's getting there. We're getting there. In, in, in a quick few years, it will be. This um, is true. And, uh, you know, always uh, been friends, always been, in, you know, uh, if I dare say myself, admirers of each other's like, this you know, willpower and, and work ethic and all these different things. Um, but one thing that I don't think Ashley really knows too much about is this record company. And so as we go through each of these releases, uh, each episode will be dedicated to one specific release that we've done. Um, and Ashley will have no background. I will give her, I won't tell her what it is. You know, if she wants to figure out what chronological, you know, comes next, she can do that. But, um, all of her questions will hopefully be all of your questions. But what I'm hoping happens is that it at least piques people's interest to go check out the rest of the album, you know, go listen to it, support the artists because, you know, just because these albums didn't have a $10 million marketing budget, uh, doesn't mean that there aren't some absolute classics in here. Now, there's also a lot of, you know, stuff that's probably not good or probably hasn't aged well. We'll we'll get to that. But um, before we kick off into any of that, and and you know what we'll do is we'll do some introductions, because um, this first uh, release only had two tracks on it. So we got some time. We have some time. Um, again, I'm Shahab Zagari. I started GC Records uh, while in college. Uh, the year was actually 1998. It was fall 1998. We started working on it, submitted the paperwork, you know, so gave up the cash. Uh, and then it was January 1999 when we went to the singer of Introspect's house and had a pizza party and stuffed all of the records that were picked up in LA into the covers that were ordered somewhere online. And we just stuffed them, had fun, and that was it. That was the first first actual release. Uh, and, and through this you know podcast series, we'll probably get into more of that history and lore, but uh, I'm gonna kick it over to you, Ashley. Let's get a, a little uh, elevator bio from you. You know, um, this is just going to expose how little I know about any of this musical genre. So I'm Ashley Stone. I am technically Dr. Stone with too many degrees in music, specifically classical music and very specifically opera. So this is going to be an assertive musical education from my bro Shahab. And I'm really, really excited. Yay. I'm so, so excited too. Um, you know, and one thing that I, I don't want to, you know, scare you off is that the the label has never been one style of music um you know already i mean even knpr when they talk about gc records they say the punk rock record label and that that's where the roots were but honestly you'll see from episode two when we when we do this next one uh from the get-go it's been a multitude and a range of genres some record labels they're the you know, opera label, the classical label, the hip hop label. Uh, none of our releases sound the same. Every single one sounds completely different. But one thing that I've always said is, but if you imagine all of these different GC records groups, them all playing a, a festival similar to Coachella or something like that, right? Like an all day thing. It would not be weird. It would it would kind of mesh, and you you know that's that's kind of the feeling I get. So GC Records, why GC Records? So again, this was 1998, 1999. Uh, for those of you that remember, and those of you that don't know, in the early days of the internet, there was uh, a bubble that burst. There was people were selling dot coms. I mean, it was like highway robbery. You want you want you know orbits dot com? Well, you're gonna have to give me one hundred fifty thousand dollars <laughs> or whatever it was. You remember this? I do. It was absolutely that way. Right? So I was like, okay, we got to pick a name that there is no way anyone else in the entire world would ever accidentally have it and say we did it first. And so the actual full name of the record label is Gekido Comet Records. 
there is no one that would ever accidentally pick that name. Now, what does the name mean? And, you know, you know, lovingly, everyone calls it GC Records and, you know, web address gcrecords.com. It just it rolls off the tongue better. Um, but I w- when I was in high school, I don't want to bore the listeners, but let's just say <laughs> I gave some high theatrics during a history project uh, that was about the uh, Boston Tea Party. Okay. Uh yelled basically drew the king on the board and had a punching fight with the chalkboard and <laughs> so awesome. you know completely unrelated there was a japanese foreign exchange student in our class and i wanted him to dub me something you know give me a name like give me a name in japanese and he was like oh you're gekido i was like all right uh, awesome. what does that mean and he was like it means ultimate anger and i was like what <laughs> i'm like the <laughs> chillest dude ever I, like, I do have a short <laughs> temper but Normally, I'm yes. just like hanging out, you know, and uh, how, why, like why that? And he brought up the history project. And I was like, ah, oh, doomed, oh. right? So he was in that class anyway. So I, I took that. I got the, the I got the name Gekido tattooed on my leg. I was like, he dubbed me this. That is me. And then when I tried to come up with something that no one else would copyright before us, that's that's what we did, and and it stuck. Um, also. Uh, the the name Shahab Shahab means comet or shooting star in Arabic. So I had a friend in LA and he would joke. He's like, okay, so you name the record company Shahab Shahab Records then, because <laughs> it's you and you. I was like, dude, I was just trying to pick something no one else had picked, right? Um, so then you know, uh, when I went to college, that's where I met the singer of Introspect. We immediately you know stood out like a sore thumb at uc irvine you know there was not a lot of uh people that let's just say looked like us you know from the punk gothic like dark kind of dyed hair kind of era uh and so we instantly were like we're friends right and so he was doing this thing in his bedroom it was taking like uh 1970s sing-along anthemic i mean think the clash kind of music uh, and pairing it with at the time what was modern EDM, which was, you know, very heavily influenced by European music, by German music. He loved this uh, band called Atari Teenage Riot, who used a lot of Atari samples in their music and a lot of like heavy, heavy distortion and fuzz and almost punk rock singing on top of it. Um, so he took that idea, but put sing songy, you know, vocals to it. And I was like, this is so cool. Um, and so he was like, well, I got some songs. I was like, well, I want to start this label. And why did I want to start the label? I wanted to do it because I was doing my own very experimental music and I knew nobody wanted that. You know, there was, I was not going to have a meeting with Geffen or, virgin or capital like no one wants what i'm doing kind of thing so i had to figure it out right and so playing shows i i started to meet people who were diy doing their own just going directly to the pressing plant and saying here's my check you know and here's a cd with the songs um and so slowly but surely i found out what the process was and how to do it and all of this it all started with this first seven inch um we dubbed it the Education 7-inch. Um, a lot of um, Dave's lyrics uh, tend to be political. Um, and I would almost say the types of lyrics that... Oh, and the, the name of the band is Introspect, even though the S in it is spelled with a 5. Again, throwing to the late 90s Europe like influence kind of stuff, right? Um, so when, you know, introspect lyrics are very much in line with what I would say most Gen Z politics, like where Gen Z politics are in terms of climate change and late stage capitalism. I mean, introspect was doing it in 1999. Um, so I think, I think a lot of people will will get into it. And again, um, just bear in mind, uh, as we go into this first song here, which is the, the, you know, um, the song is called education and that's uh, why we dubbed the single this, um, 
this was the first recording, right? So this was literally, literally recorded in his bedroom. So don't, you know, like again, lo-fi at home kind of stuff later on in introspect's career. And we'll talk about that when we come back from the song. Um, they, they did some pretty big stuff, did some really cool tours and amazing recordings. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So this first song is called education by introspect. There you have it. Uh, education uh, by introspect. Um, 
Later on in the band's career, they actually ended up, so most of these early recordings were drum machine. They actually added a live drummer to go along with the drum machine, uh, added a whole new layer to everything. In fact, there is a version of that song that was recorded years later with an actual producer and an engineer in a, you know, studio when they got signed to AF Records in Pittsburgh and, you know, they were punching in lyrics, right? Where like if it, one note was off on one word, they would have you just sing that word in place of it kind of thing, right? Um, so I'll have to, you know, sidebar, I'll send that to you later, Ashley. But cool. Um, very lo-fi, very bedroom uh, recording. Um, but that was our first foray into releasing something. Uh, what do you think? It's fascinating there. So uh, my limited exposure to anything that would be even remotely considered music like this um, would be things that I've heard in video games. My, my two genres are opera and video game soundtracks. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of energy. Like I can see that being like an epic boss battle. Totally. Um, Harkening back to a question I've been holding for a hot minute. What is, what is a seven inch? What is, what ah, is, good what, question. What is that thing? <laughs> because I feel like uh, in the you know age of Spotify, a lot of people have that question. So there is something that uh, I guess in the industry, you know, it's it's generally those forty five records. Mm -hmm. You know what a forty five is? So it's the, yeah. the the LP is the long player. Those are called twelve inches because they're twelve inches in diameter. The 45s, sometimes they can be 45 revolutions per minute on the record player. Sometimes they're 33, though. So um, instead of calling it a 45 or whatever, you would call it a 7-inch record. So, oh, okay. And in fact, I think this 7-inch uh, is 33 RPM, so you don't have to flip it to 45. Because we... Uh, with 45 revolutions per minute, you get less minutes on the vinyl. <laughs> with 33, okay. you get a, it's, it goes slower. You get a little bit. You can put a little bit longer. Uh, uh, actually, it doesn't even have to be music on, on vinyl. But, you know, whatever you're putting on there, there's a limited time that you've got, unlike CDs, unlike digital. So was it um, like VHSs at the fact that if you recorded at a slower rate, was there any audio quality differentiation between the slower and faster rates? Yes. Very good question. For more time. This is why we have you on here, Dr. Stone. <laughs> Thank you. Such good <laughs> questions, honestly. Okay. Um, yes. So generally, most people wouldn't be able to notice it, I think, right? Um, but for example, had we put these two songs, right? So we put these two songs on a seven inch record at 33 RPMs. Had we put these two songs on a 12 inch at 45 RPMs, to the ear, the song sounds the same. Like the song is playing how it's supposed to be played. Mm -hmm. I mean, supposed to be heard. Yeah. Um, but the quality on the 12 inch at 45 RPMs is just so much better. Okay. So much better. There's also a thing with. Um, uh, when you overplay your records, then they start getting scratched because your needle is chipping away at that groove little by little and kind of like tires on a car would make it bald. So then it starts skipping between tracks and you don't really want that, right? So um, the 45 RPMs have much deeper grooves, you know, and okay. but you can fit less music. But then that less music is... You know, that's probably, and again, I don't know the science of it. It's probably why it sounds better because you're not, mm. you know, uh, squeezing as much as yeah. you can, you know, and making those um, grooves thinner and thinner. Mm. Um, good question there. Um, Thank you. Um, happy to wander back to the song unless you had something more to add. No, I was just going to say, so now let's go into the second song. Oh, okay. Totally different energy than that first one that first one again very like german discotheque you know thrrr, you know that kind of uh crazy crazy stuff this this one is i don't know it's so charming it, it definitely feels british to me a little bit you know again going with that that clash um 
example. But here we go. So this this is RKN.RLL, or better known as Rock and Roll. Uh. And shove it all back into your face. False release. The rare sound perspective put it all in its place. Well, the notes of a prophet and the voice of the whore. Corrupt the sex and power step for rock and roll. The notes of a prophet and the voice of the whore. Corrupt the sex and power. Okay, to play. Extend a contract. Read it and repackage and shove it all back into your face. False release. The rare sound perspective put it all in its place. Well, the notes of a prophet and the voice of the whore. Corrupt the sex and power step for rock and roll. Rock and roll from introspect. Uh, how do you compare that to the other one? Still, um, still lo-fi a little bit, but yeah, no, I, uh, that one made it a bit more apparent what like the like the bass instrumentation was. Um, but I definitely still have questions. Um, not the least of which is why part of like Angels We Have Heard on High was in like the keyboard solo. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that that was disclosed to you because I'm very curious, like from a creative perspective, why that was chosen. Uh, yeah, I don't know, and and I but I do know again that in that same album that they re-recorded Education, they re-recorded this one as well, um, mm-hmm. and I don't think I think it's out of print, and I don't think it's on Spotify or anything, so I'll have to share those with you because there's, there's even some Zelda esque moments in that oh. album, but um, um, I don't know, no yeah, and, and so I'm not sure, I, and totally I don't think fair. I ever had that conversation, you know. Um, but maybe we'll write to Dave and, uh, you know, uh, answer it for everyone, uh, in episode two or three or something. That'd be rad. Um, yeah, go for it. What were you going to say? So I have so many questions. Um, so you were mentioning that these were like bedroom recordings. Were you there? Did you see like the setup? I wasn't there for the recording of these two. But yeah, I mean, it was literally in his dorm room. It was all like, dude, it was crazy. It was like I Omega hard drives. I mean, this was like, er, this is late nineties. So this was just like yeah. insane. And, and I was blown away that, you know, everything that I had heard up until that point with drum machines was this video game music, mm-hmm. you know, electronic dance music or hip hop. I never, yeah. I never heard of anyone using it to do these kinds of like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, these 190 beat per minute kind of 
yeah. uh, things. So um, it was cool. And in fact, later then he, you know, created studios in different houses. And for a good first 10 years of the label, he recorded a majority of the releases. Uh, so I had seen all of his setups and his setups, you know, uh, getting bigger and bigger. Um, so was it largely just him? Like, was it just him with a bunch of like kind of digital mixing? That's it. On on this seven inch on this record, heck. yes, that he did everything. He did all the the harmonies and all the you know. And again, um, there was no uh, engineer in there going, "All right, let's yeah. do that line again," or let's you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. He was just, and he was just having fun anyway. Yeah. Um, just messing around at the time. There was no SoundCloud. There was no. YouTube. There was no YouTube. Like YouTube was 2002 mm -hmm. or three something, right? Yeah. So, and we were really excited to get the production, you know, again, in that song, rock and roll, he's talking about the working class poor. Right. And so we were like, yeah, the means we have, we now have the means to make our yes. own records. We'll silk screen our t-shirts and go on tour. And coincidentally, the year after this record came out, we went on tour. Uh, we went on a West Coast tour, and that we'll have to do a whole episode on um, because with with the label, every time we hit a milestone year, I always did a kind of a project mm -hmm. surrounding that. So for the ten year anniversary, we did a DVD release instead of a, like cool. an album kind of, but it was all music anyway. Um, but it was like music videos, and and so a bulk of the tour footage from that year 2000 summer 2000 tour i ch cut up and included in that dvd and now you know this is 2024 when we're taping this uh no one buys dvds anymore and so i took the entire that entire release and put it up on youtube we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later but one question i have for you going forward on these episodes i think two songs felt about right what do you think because I'm inclined to agree. I mean, there's certainly plenty to discuss. These these albums, you know, uh, forthcoming, they're going to have a lot more songs. Um, so I, I think maybe that's what we'll do. You know, I'll, I'll ch hand pick two of my favorites and we'll kind of listen to them um, and, and go back and forth. Um, that's it for this episode. Uh, again, I'm Shahab Zagari and I'm here with Ashley Stone. And uh, we hope uh, you come back. Episode two, we're going to talk about the first compilation release, which was the uh, record label's second release after this seven inch record. Uh, and it was a CD of bands from all over the world. Um, from gothic from De gothic music from Denmark uh, to hip hop from Atlanta to punk rock from San Francisco uh, and the title of the album the compilation album is we're not generation X and we're going to get into why it was called that on episode two so we'll see you there